I want to thank you for joining us for our April 6th, uh, 2021 referendum community uh, discussion. I want to talk to you a little bit about that. And uh, we're going to be sharing our screen here uh, in just a moment. Uh, we have PowerPoint for you to see. So if you, uh, if on your screen, you should see a April 6, 2020 referendum. Okay. Uh, and so with that, we'll uh, get started. Advance the slide here. So some people have been asking uh, a little bit or talking a lot about, you know, what kind of a strategic planning process has been in place and what kinds of things have been discussed. And uh, with uh, in the past few years, um, our, our district has been looking quite a bit at and asking for our community to speak to us about the needs of our community schools. Uh, we've engaged parents, uh, students, staff in many surveys, uh, some to do with a, a strategic planning process that started in 2018. Uh, that strategic planning process uh, did survey parents, students, and staff members about how can we be a better school district. Uh, and from that survey, our board developed uh, with a community process, 14 SMART goals. Um, the top of which uh, has to do with two things. One, uh, communication uh, and trying to improve our communication with our families uh, and our school, uh, from the school to the family and family back, uh, as well as our community. And another is to really look at how we can improve our academics, especially through uh, coordinating better and giving more common planning time with our staff. And so we were really looking at a lot of those things and 12 other SMART goals that we had. Uh, then as we entered into uh, 2020, we asked uh, FEH to come in and do a design uh, workshop with us and look at a and, and complete a facility needs assessment. Uh, that happened in January of 2020. Uh, an advisory task force was then created by our school board and FEH to uh, look at that study uh, and ask questions from the community about what they think our needs should be as we move forward. And as they looked over those survey questions um, and the responses, the board said, we, we, need to, we need to really dig deep into this information that came back. We had a wealth of information, whether it was on whether or not we should keep Rockbridge School, um, which, we've, which we've subsequently sold based on those survey results. Uh, we did, it, uh, we did end, up, uh, end up completing a sale of that at the end of the calendar year here. Uh, and uh, other things about how we should look or, or what we should do as a school district moving forward. The big things that came back from that uh, were, one, we wanted to create an ad hoc committee to review that data uh, and, and to go through a, it with a fine tooth comb. And we had anywhere from 20 to 30 individuals. Um, and how did, how did we find those individuals? Uh, well, we took all of our list of names, parents, business people, uh, governmental officials, uh, other people who've been volunteering in the schools and so on. We basically had Siri randomly generate numbers and we just started calling people on the list and asking them if they would come until we got a group that was uh, good enough for us to be able to socially distance in the high school library. On that, uh, we had again, 20 to 30 people and they reviewed those survey results uh, and started talking about what, what do they mean? Uh, I, I talked to you once already about Rockridge. Uh, that was a pretty easy, what does this mean when 92% of the people said, if you're not gonna use it as an instructional facility, please sell it. Uh, so we did. Uh, and then other things came back, like what, what should we look like? How can we get more efficient as a school? Uh, and that ad hoc committee basically gave the board some direction. They said, you know, if we're gonna move into the future, let's look at a three building model. Uh, if we can't get into a three building model, 
then uh, start with a four building model, but then have a clear vision for how to get to a three building model in the future. Um, so that we have some efficiencies that way. Uh, and then we uh, looked at a number of other uh, things that were related to our facilities, the needed fixes for those facilities, and other uh, programs that we were doing here. So that led us to the November 2020 referendum. Uh, in that referendum, we, we listened to the community. We developed a three building model uh, that was $27 million. And we paired that three building model with a recurring referendum that would be $1.25 million. Now $1.25 million did pass in November. Uh, and that was for us to continue programming and to meet all the needs of the district going into the future, um, as far out as four or five, maybe even six years. And uh, that was predicated on going into a three building model. So that was with those efficiencies that were built in. Uh, in, in, in the idea of staying in a five building model, uh, one of the things that we had discussed at an ad hoc committee was that we uh, as a school district uh, have been making plans for the future and those plans included getting a healthier fund balance. And when I, when I came here uh, in 2015-16 uh, school year, we had about 11% fund balance. Now we're hovering around a 25%, 20 to 25% fund balance. Um, and we did that by, um, as our staff uh, were retiring, we weren't hiring new staff to replace. So that's how we started carving out the ability to save some funds and, and to try to um, you know, address the budget needs that we need. Um, that's led to some inefficiencies in the five building model. I keep saying we're probably right size staff for a uh, five building model, or excuse me, for, for a three building model, uh, but not a five building model. And if we stay in a five building model, uh, we would probably end up having to hire. Um, and that's why that uh, referendum that was passed in November was paired with a three building model uh, to make sure that we can cover those needs in the future. So uh, from November to now, what happened? Uh, I'm sure you're wondering what, you know, what, what happened, what kind of planning process has gone on and how did we retool to get to this $19.7 million uh, project? Because uh, you know, Billings Property looked at a number of things. We had many, many meetings. Uh, they, they wanted to make, you know, make sure that we, we still address those identified maintenance needs that, uh, uh, were talked about earlier uh, in the in the study done by FEH and throughout the advisory task force, and so we looked at uh, all of those needs as well as the ADA and code issues um, that were found in that study, and um, we wanted to identify ways that we could continue to be more efficient. So we looked at anything from. Uh, going to a referendum that would be just a fix it model, put another Band-Aid on, uh, much like our last referendum in the 2015-16 school year, where we kind of just, we, you know, we kept that under a dollar and we fixed the most needed things that needed to be fixed to get us out so that we could do all the strategic planning. We could actually bring people in and talk about the future. Um, and that, those identified fixes came to about six to $8 million. Uh, we talked about how can we capture uh, in a $20 million referendum everything that we were doing in a $27 million referendum, but do it within a four building model and just remodeling and maybe not do so much with an addition. Uh, so we, we, we took a look at that. Uh, we had um, many of our staff look over those four building models and Actually, to try to capture those, uh, those went over that $20 million mark and were seen as probably um, not good. So, uh, you know, it, and, and some of them came with issues as to how are we going to structure um, the school district? For instance, if we, if one of those four buildings models was to have a second and third grade at Jefferson, uh, issues came up with that discussion about, you know, uh, We've got all the art, music, and FIAT facilities that 
you know, for those larger body students, um, you know, an outdoor space and those kind of things. So we had some pros and cons. Some of the some of the pros though were the ability to walk in town, maybe go to those in-town field trips that a second and third grader can do. Um, we also looked at uh, Jefferson becoming an EC through 4K building. Um, there was some worries there about drop off and pick up uh, right there on Main Street with the littlest of our children. Um, because if you go to Lincoln and you see a drop off and pick up, uh, the parents get out of their vehicles because the, the children are too small to get out themselves and do that stuff. So they, they, and they take them in. So that was a, a concern uh, that we had. But anyway, it led us to discussing more. Um, what if we changed our three building model and focused most of the building at the middle school area? And we'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like with an intermediate school attached to the middle school later. But uh, that's how we got to the current question today, which is having an EC through second grade at the current Doudna, a three through five uh, at the a new intermediate center at the RMS campus, the middle school campus, six through eight, still there, and then nine, 12 here. So um, again, why do we need a referendum? Uh, well, through our strategic planning process and, and listening to our community, we heard these things from our, our community. The community expects the district to provide the best educational opportunities in the most cost-effective and efficient ways possible. Uh, we continue to work at that every day. Uh, and um, we are, are trying to be as cost effective and efficient as possible and deliver the best education we can. I'll be the first to tell you, uh, we haven't arrived. We're still working really, really hard on that. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why uh, this came, this idea came together because we feel strongly uh, with the feedback we got from the community that this will be a better model for our students and it will help us meet our needs and it will be more efficient uh, and cost savings. Two, we also heard from our community that the district expects us to have facilities that are in compliance with building code, the American with Disabilities Act law. And some people question and even today, well, you know, I, I thought maybe we were gonna tackle some of that in the last referendum, how come that didn't get fixed, you know, or, or uh, why are we continuing to operate buildings that aren't up to code? And, and um, the only answer that I can have for that is that our, our last referendum that wasn't that wasn't a focus, uh, and it's not because it wasn't it, it shouldn't have been a focus. It was our last referendum. We really just wanted to make sure that uh, we secured really the absolute needed fixes that needed to be fixed, so that we could embark on a planning process uh, that would get us into the future. Um, and a lot of these building codes and uh, ADA um, codes issues uh, really weren't brought to our attention until FDH went through and did their study. And they shared with us where we could improve our facilities uh, and uh, meet those codes. And then lastly, uh, the community expects the facilities uh, to be adequately maintained and kept up to date. And I know uh, yeah, with our school funding formula and, and how we pay for the schools, I know how difficult that is uh, to try to maintain facilities within the structures that we have and resources that we have uh, that come in. Uh, the reason I say that is because, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the things that we have to do uh, with this building is to put a new roof on it. And I know that people say, well, this is a new high school, but it is 25 years old and that roof does need to be replaced after 25 years. And $1.3 million is double the whole budget that Mr. Jones has uh, that he can work with on both maintenance and facilities. Uh, and to try to do that within one year or even take his budget and make savings for just that one project, over the course of years, uh, we just cannot do that. We do not have the funding to be able to stay up on top of those large items. And that's also why the state gives us this avenue to ask the public for extra resources during times uh, to, to fix the needed fixes. 
and, and that's uh, why we're looking at having that referendum uh, to fix the things that need to be fixed. Mr. Board. All right, thank you. My name is Steve Board, I'm the business official here. Um, at the end of this, there's about four or five slides that I'll go through. If you have any questions, we're happy to take them. If you are on uh, Zoom, you can either um, chime in when it's quiet or you can just type them in the chat and we'll get to all of your questions and try to answer them to the best of our ability. We've also got our full team on board here tonight. We've got uh, Kyle Kramer from Kramer Brothers is here. Um, Kevin Mullen from Baird Financial Services is here. And Kevin and Bobby from uh, FEH is, is online as well. So uh, we should be able to answer any questions that you might have in regards to that. So, okay, so with that, uh, so what is in this referendum? This is a $19.7 million capital referendum. And so the school district um, would have the ability to borrow up to that amount. And the primary things that we would be looking at doing would be that new intermediate school uh, attached onto the current Richland Middle School at that, at that campus. One of the cost savings that we had from the $27 million project to this is that we're only doing an addition onto one site. Okay, that other model had a big addition at Doudna as well as the middle school. We were able to realize some cost savings by moving one more grade over to the middle school and making that intermediate school center um, a three through five campus. So there's a little bit bigger uh, addition there at, at the um, Richard Middle School campus. As Mr. Burke just uh, alluded to, we've got a full roof replacement that needs to be done here at the high school. Um, it's a 1996 original roof. Uh, there are roof replacements that need to happen in some areas of the middle school, not the entire middle school, but certainly some areas. In addition to some other larger ticket items like resurfacing and replacing some of our hard surface areas, concrete loading docks in the back of our kitchen area, parking lots, those kind of things. Um, exterior repair at the middle school, uh, water intrusion locations, things like that. So those are kind of the big ticket items that would be included in this $19.7 million referendum. This is a uh, plan taken directly from the flyer. So those of you who are here, we're able to pick up a flyer. Those of you who are joining remotely, uh, if you go to the district's website and under the four parents link, there is a referendum 2021 link and you actually have access to the PDF of this flyer. And this particular image is taken directly from that. Um, I'll kind of just verbally go through it because you're not gonna be able to see my pointer if you're joining us online. Uh, but this is the entire Richland Middle School campus, okay? The site plan, as well as, I'm gonna try to, I'm gonna try to keep up with you. All right, <laughs> as well as uh, the additions. So the area to the left in gray that has green numbers on it, that is, our current Richland Middle School, okay? That's area grades six through eight uh, in that area, okay? Uh, the, the big change that I think will happen at the middle school is that right now our sixth graders are located kind of in the center area around the cafeteria in the IMC. And then our seventh and eighth graders are down on the far Northern wing, along with some of our special education in the Northeastern corner. Uh, the plan is to likely move that, uh, that entire wing to the north to become sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, okay, classrooms there. And then the center area currently located, uh, currently um, occupied by our sixth graders would become kind of a uh, spec ed and common uh, resource area for people, uh, EBD rooms, uh, an autism room, as well as those special education rooms that, that we need. We've got there in blue, um, there's some occupational and physical therapy rooms, some uh, speech rooms, things like that. So that's kind of what would happen to the current middle school. Just to the east or just up from the cursor, you'll see our music area. Um, that is our current vocal area there in, in blue. And then next to that is a classroom, that classroom off to the side that's labeled um, music ensemble. For the most part, that's going to become the elementary music room. Okay, so that is one of the areas that the uh, intermediate center, the grades three through five, those students would have to walk that little bit past the gym and up into the uh, music room. And then just to the north of that, or just to uh, above that, actually to the east, is our uh, band room. There's going to be some renovation in the band room to make better use of that space. 
and then a small addition to the north of that band room um, for to accommodate the, the number of students, as well as some instrument storage there. So anything in orange on this screen is, or on this picture, is new construction. Okay, that would be add-on from what is actually there. Anything in uh, green, blue, yellow, uh, orange, or pink, uh, or light blue, those are all different kinds of renovation that are going on. Okay, so orange is new. All the other colors are some sort of renovation, color-coded by how much or how heavy of renovation is needed. Also to the east there, off the, the back end of the gym, you'll see a new wood shop. Currently, the wood shop is uh, located in an area um, next to art. Uh, that art room would become, um, or excuse me, that area would become an, an art room. So we would have two art rooms, one for the intermediate center students and one for the middle school students. And then our tech ed area would have a 21st century standard tech ed area for our students to be able to um, explore and gain knowledge in, those, in that, uh, that area um, using modern equipment in modern spaces. And then to the south, okay, so the current um, kind of drop-off area at the middle school, uh, this large area here in orange, uh, that would become the new intermediate center, okay? So there's a multi-purpose room, uh, which is the equivalent of about a half of gymnasium, enough for them to be able to conduct their PE uh, classes as well as lunch. Um, and then all of the classrooms around the, the, the rest of the L or backwards L, are going to be regular education classrooms and spec ed classrooms um, for for that those grades okay and they're not labeled on here um, because it could change in any given year just like they do now in our current system in the lower right hand corner the, the southwest corner that would be the office area where our principal guidance counselor our health room and our greeting office would be located so our third through fifth graders would actually enter the building right where the, the blue number four is. Okay, that's how they would enter the building. They would go right into their area. And the sixth, seventh, and eighth graders would enter down on uh, their end, down in the main office area, down on, on that end. So we're going to try to keep uh, these groups of kids separated as much as possible. Um, the most interaction that they would have would be on the bus. Okay, and that's something that occurs right now. We know that the pickup and drop off location at the current middle school is, is uh, uh, cumbersome at times. Okay, and so that entire area would be restructured. The plan right now is that the parents drop off and pick up would be along the front. Okay, and they could park anywhere along there uh, to allow their kids to get off. And then the uh, parking lot to the south, we would have bus lanes. Um, where they would be able to, just like they do at the high school, park the buses, and that would be the loading and unloading area for them. The track actually gets moved 90 degrees. It runs more up and down. And then the football field, which runs the other way, uh, gets shifted and is along the top side. You can't see it. It's going to be about where that blue banner is. In addition, on that east side, we would have a new playground for those intermediate center students, and they would have a modern playground um, for them to be able to come right off the, the gym or the multi-purpose room after lunch, go out to the playground, and then come back in uh, for lunch or recess. Mr. Ward, can I just, can you show us where the original 1960s building was, 1968 or whatever it is? Do you know what that is? That area right there? And so we've had one or two additions since then. This is an addition here. Right, it goes right here, right, Mr. Hills? And, and, right. and was the gym was added on? So both yeah, sides. Part. Okay. Yeah, and then this area here was added on, correct? Yeah, so, so this is an add on. So that's 1972. And the original building is what? 67. 67. And this gym art, uh, this is one of the key areas where we're having roof issues at the, at the middle school, correct, Brian? Correct. Mr. Jones? Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Okay. Uh, all right. So, what happens if this fails? Okay. So, uh, I'm not here to cast doom and gloom, but I also think it's important for everybody to understand the possibilities and the realities of what happens um, if it's successful, but also if it fails. 
All right, so uh, one of the things that, that still has to be done is we have to address um, these maintenance needs, okay? If you've been to our middle school anytime in the last nine months, if you go into the gym, you will see large tarps and contraptions set up to try to keep uh, water off the floor, catch it from the leaky roofs and funnel it into garbage bins, okay? I mean, we have uh, issues that need to be fixed at these facilities, okay? Um, so we have to address those. And if we uh, can't address them through a referendum, then we are going to have to address them in other means. And that means that we're going to have to try to find cost savings from reduced programming curricularly or educationally. Uh, we may have to make um, some staff reductions or simply just find other sacrifices, okay, that we might have to make. Even if we dip into that fund balance, if that puts us in a position where we have to then short-term borrow again to meet our expenses until state aid or property tax revenue comes in, that's an interest expense and a lending cost that we're going to have to incur. That, that ends up being about the cost of a teacher. A couple of years ago, we were around $80,000 in interest and loan fees just to, just to have a short-term uh, borrowing cost. So those are things that we're going to have to understand if this uh, doesn't pass. Um, we are going to continue to have approximately a $250,000 uh, expense and continued annual operating costs at Lincoln and Jefferson. Okay. Um, that's about our, our cost of what we have for operating expenses at each of those two locations. Now we would continue that. And then from a student standpoint, we're going to continue to have some students that have to transition between all five buildings in our district. So right now, our 4K kids and EC 4K kids go to Lincoln. Um, depending on what area of town they live into, uh, the kindergartners, they would, well, actually all the kindergartners would then go to Doudna. And then depending on what area of town they live in, they may go to Jefferson for grades one through five before they go to the middle school for their next transition before they end up at the high school for their final transition. Instead, studies show every time a student has to go through one of those building transitions, there's a higher level of anxiety, there's a retention loss, those kinds of things that affect student learning. So the, the more we can minimize the transitions that kids have throughout their educational career, the better off those students are going to be. Well, then what are the big benefits? Okay, so some of the key benefits that we have is that I just mentioned those transitions between buildings. Now every student would have, in this model, every student would have two transitions, one from the Doudna to the Intermediate Sense School, and then they would stay at the Intermediate School campus from really grades three through grade eight, and then they would have one more transition from grade eight to grade nine at the, at the high school. Okay, so reduce those number of transitions, not just for some students, but for all of our students. Our teachers and our staff are going to be able to more effectively collaborate. We will have all of grade one teachers in the same building in the same location, all grade three teachers in the same building, in the same location. That allows them to meet and collaborate on uh, best learning methods, greater equity in learning. Okay, it's impossible to run two schools and have everything be exactly the same. I'm talking Jefferson and Doudna. All right, sometimes Jefferson, they're going to say, well, why, why does Jefferson get to do that? Doudna doesn't. Why does Dowdy get to do that? Jefferson doesn't. If all of our kids in the same grade are at the same building, there will be uh, equity and learning between all of our students. And then we will be um, more in compliance with our ADA and building code. In addition, we're expanding the number of spec ed classrooms that we have across the district to further meet the needs of all of our students across the district. Many people ask if we go down to, to three campuses or essentially four buildings are we going to have room to grow should we have an explosion of, of population explosion and the answer is yes we still have approximately 350 bodies to be able to expand um, should we have an influx of a population increase or enrollment increase and one of the things we're looking to do is that we're hoping that this will help reduce the number of students that we have opening and rolling out of our district okay we had a big influx of or outflux of students leaving our district um, six, seven years ago, we've started to slowly reverse that trend. We think that this will be a way that we will not only be able to keep students in our district, but maybe attract and retain those students uh, back into our district. And then finally, uh, this is one of the most historically low borrowing rates that we've ever seen. Um, you know, several years ago, we thought, you know, interest rates at, at four and a half or five were crazy low. And now, uh, bonds are being sold around 2%, okay? So the, the 
uh, cost savings uh, long term for having these historically low interest rates. Um, it certainly would be better now than it would be with higher interest rates. So what does that tax investment mean for our public and our taxpayers? Um, so $100,000 home, okay, in Richland Center, in the Richland School District, uh, on average, not everybody's taxes are going to go up exactly the same amount, but on average, okay, they would go up um, $110 on an annual basis. This is about $9.17 a month. The average home in the Richland School District or the average property value is $125,000. So for those people, you're talking about $11.50 a month that their taxes would go up um, through the life of this bond. All right. So with that, I see we've got some chats. We wanna, so uh, first one is... Uh, Mr. The sixth grade uh, shifting room locations will happen regardless if the referendum passes. That, that is correct. So uh, in, in our process of discovery, as we were looking at a uh, referendum and, and meeting with different groups of people, one of the ideas that came up is how can we be even more efficient within the, within the five building model we have, and one of those things that uh, the middle school discovered is uh, by uh, having a concentration of sixth, seventh, and eighth grade to the left in that uh, bigger addition area uh, that happened a number of years ago, they thought that that would be more efficient uh, moving uh, the sixth grade over into that sixth, seventh, or that seventh and eighth grade wing. Uh, they would be replacing uh, the uh, special ed rooms that are there, and the special ed rooms would move to a more centrally located area. Um, that would be paired with uh, the idea that we're trying to uh, look at more of a, um, a team teaching model with the regular ed teacher uh, and having some more of those kids, instead of being pulled out of their uh, regular ed classrooms, having the supports be brought in, uh, that, therefore using smaller rooms for the special ed rooms than what they currently need now. So um, that's something that they're really looking to do. Uh, with that model. Thank you, Mr. Devin, for uh, putting the comments in uh, as we look at that. Uh, Ms. Lasky, uh, of the 250000 in expenses for Jefferson and Lincoln, what is the cost for Lincoln by itself? I don't have that number off the top of my head. Kevin uh, Epperly, um, do you remember what the cost for Lincoln was alone? It was about between 35 and 40% of that total cost. Okay. All right, so maybe just right around 100,000, maybe just a little bit under. Right around 100, yeah, right around 100,000. Okay. Uh, next question. Uh, Will both Jefferson and Lincoln go up for sale immediately after the new buildings are built, or will you continue to pay these uh, to pay these expenses either way? A uh, good question, uh, Jess. Uh, I know that the board has talked um, about selling uh, Lincoln immediately. Uh, we know that um, the value uh, that that building holds to us as an educational facility just isn't there. We would have to put a lot of, a lot more money and resources in it to continue to use it as, as an instructional facility. Um, however, through the strategic planning process, some of, uh, some good ideas were generated around Jefferson that the district may think about holding on to that a little bit longer. Shall some of those ideas come to fruition? Uh, some of those ideas were things like, um, a, a, uh, excuse me, a district run child care facility, um, a charter school focusing on, um, you know, a, a couple of different ideas and needs that came up through the process uh, and, and other things. Uh, so um, the district is probably going to hold on to that building at least uh, probably for a year to start looking more at those ideas in detail uh, past uh, or post referendum. Uh, so, so we may hold on to Jefferson just a little bit longer to make sure 
uh, that, that does have value to us uh, as a community uh, and, and may hold some instructional value or at least instructional support value through a child care center or something of the like. And I would add on that that um, depending on what uh, purpose that serves would depend on how the revenue for that building um, comes into play. For instance, if it becomes a community child care, district run child care, that would be run through a community service fund. It would not be a, a burden from our general operating fund. So uh, different, uh, whatever the source of it ends up being um, would, would drive how that's being funded, those operational expenses. Okay, next question. Will this general obligation bond do, uh, or with this general obligation bond, excuse me, do our taxes have a chance to be much higher if we have, or if we have any sort of max exodus of tax paying citizens? How high could the taxes go up considering our enrollment is projected to go down? Okay, actually, Mr. Mola, do you wanna to try to tackle that one? Sure, sure. So the tax impact is based on uh, the, I don't think you'll be on camera unless here. you come up here. Which so if you, want, if you want, you can come, come around and, and the camera's here and the mic is actually attached to the camera there. So Great. if you so, speak your voice that way, it'd be the best. Great. Thanks. So uh, the tax impact is based on the amount of property tax value behind the school district. Um, so if people left, there's still tax base here, assuming that there are still buyers for those uh, properties. Um, the tax base doesn't go to zero. So um, that the, the likelihood that that happens is very slight. We've had some dips in property value. We've had quite a bit of growth in property value here in uh, Richland. The growth in property value recently has been very, very strong over the past five years. We've assumed growth in value to be roughly 2% a year in based on that number which I think is a very conservative number based on the historical growth in Richland. So the first half of that uh, question, I don't think is uh, a strong concern. Um, with regard to enrollment, um, I think you know, the enrollment projections, again, have been very conservative um, as we've moved forward. And that's a different uh, issue that really relates more to the funding formula. Um, and that was what the uh, operational referendum was really projected to focus on. So, um, you know, it, it's a, a number that we're continuing to keep an eye on, but I think that the district has a very good handle on what it will, looks like moving forward. Thank you. Okay, so the next question, is there a safe way for students to walk or bike to the middle school location? Uh, yeah, I got that. So the answer, uh, is there a safe way for kids to uh, walk or bike to the middle school location? The answer is right now, no. However, uh, the district and the city are working together and the district just passed their half of an MOU, which the city already passed, uh, to um, have a safe routes to school, whereby the, the city, in conjunction with Southwest Partners, worked with the land developers along Highway 80 to develop a safe route to school trail. Uh, that trail will be maintained uh, mostly by efforts between the city as well as the uh, school district. Uh, and then that would uh, allow students to either walk or ride bike and not have to worry about the highway. So that, that route would go down there. Um, and we're exploring other routes between then down and the middle school uh, to see if we can get some landowners to uh, give us an easement through there uh, where we might have a future route that would connect those two buildings. And then those would be connected to the bike trail as well. So uh, that goes through town. If this referendum does not pass, will the students eventually be put into three buildings, just buildings that are in need of repair? Uh, so uh, I will tell you that there has been some discussion of that. Uh, again, our community has asked us to be more efficient. We also know that Lincoln itself uh, is, is um, past its usefulness as an educational facility for us, an instructional facility. Uh, and in order to keep it up to instructional standards, we would really have to put more money into it. 
Uh, for us, that's not a very good opportunity cost, especially when paired with the idea that we do have a lot of room up here. Um, so people have said, well, why don't we just move seventh and eighth grade up to the middle school uh, and have that be part of our plan, go to a four building model or even a three building model with a smaller addition and utilize the space in this wonderful facility up here. Uh, I will tell you that the survey results that came back on that were not favorable for having the seventh and eighth grade up here. However, that may be a reality that we have to look at should this referendum not pass so that we can be more efficient in how we deliver um, our education to students. So yes, that might be something we have to look at. All right, you've uh, touched on this a little bit, but if Jefferson costs more than double to run Lincoln, why wouldn't we just use the space to do a childcare location at Lincoln and worry about a charter school further down the road when we have more space in another school with declining enrollment? Yeah, I think I just answered that with the previous question in that um, Jefferson itself is, although it's a little bit more to run, um, you know, than uh, Lincoln, uh, it does have more space available and it's in much better condition. Uh, and again, to uh, keep Lincoln up to those standards, um, it, it, would, it would be really difficult. Uh, Three-parter, what is the total current enrollment? What is the current percentage of open enrollment out? What is the itemized breakdown of each projected project in question? Well, that's a, what is the itemized breakdown of each project in question? I guess, uh, Floyd, thank you for that question. Uh, I, I don't know exactly what you're asking with the, the bottom part, but I can talk to you, you know, a little bit more about uh, the, the total current enrollment. Uh, total current enrollment, um, oh, how, let's see here, should, it's, I suppose we've been talking about enrollment mostly in FTE. Yeah, probably. Yeah, so, so we, we should probably start there. You know, uh, we're, we hover around uh, 1350 to 1400 FTEs in our school district. Uh, that's uh, full-time equivalency. So um, again, you count that a little bit differently for a 4K student than a regular full-time student. A 4K student is 0.6. Uh, or 60% of a full-time student because of the number of hours that they attend versus other students. Um, and so uh, percentage of open enrollment, what is the current percentage of open enrollment out? And that's a hard question to answer because I don't know if you're talking about percentage compared to the whole or outs versus in. Uh, so I guess I, I have a hard time answering that without a little bit more detail. Uh, so Floyd, if you have uh, other detail, um, you can maybe ask those uh, by unmuting or... Mr. Board? Yeah. Floyd Barto. Hey, Floyd. How are you? Good. How are you? Sorry Good. to chat. It's kind of hard to, to answer or ask questions through a chat. So oh. what percentage of your resident students open enroll currently? And when I ask the question of the itemized breakdown, what what I mean with that is itemizing the the new additions or the new construction versus the current repairs. Uh, how much is it going to cost you to put a new roof on the high school? What's it going to cost uh, to do the remodel? Uh, a little shifting with the middle school, and then what's the overall total cost that's going to cost to build the intermediate section on the middle school? Yeah. Okay. So I, I get. Let's start with that question because that question uh, is a probably. I don't want to say a little bit easier to answer because uh, you know, as as Kevin from FEH, if you want to jump in as well as Kyle, will tell you that um, when you start parsing out numbers, one compared to another, uh, a, a renovation and remodel in one area. Um, might actually have some cost savings to it if you were to do an adjoining addition to another area because of, you know, startup costs, those kinds of things. So uh, I will tell you that when, when the Buildings and Property Committee was looking at that, Floyd, uh, we really identified about $8,000 worth of things that we, we really need to fix just to, um, quote unquote, put a, put a Band-Aid in place. 
eight million dollars, not eight thousand. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're right. I mean, I, if it was eight thousand, we wouldn't be here. Yeah, if it was eight thousand, we wouldn't be here. We'd be doing that. I'm sorry. I, I apologize. Thank you for correcting me. Uh, six to eight, six to eight million, but eight million was really the focus number that we were looking at to really put a bandaid on uh, and, and get us out another, you know, four or five years. Um, at that point in time, we would take a look at our ten-year project plan and take another chunk of that off, uh, and then we would just kind of continually be in what a lot of other districts are doing, uh, which is we'll have a referendum now, have another referendum. Uh, in three to five years to do some more fixes, have another referendum in three to five years to do some more fixes. Um, this would take care of most of our facilities needs probably about 10 years out, you know, 10 to 15 years out. So we looked at that uh, and we looked at the cost savings uh, that we would have in uh, making, you know, becoming more efficient to go to three campus model. Uh, and that's why uh, this was offered. So hopefully that answered that for you. Um, going back to the uh, open enrollment question, I'm still... Uh, I think I can answer Okay, it. I was so, gonna say, because there, there are other ways to think about how, how are we looking yeah. at. So I don't know what the percentage actually is, Floyd, but we have um, net loss, if you will. Um, so students leaving, that's probably the, the best students coming answer. in is, is right around 160 students right now. Um, and that is something that, that we have uh, addressed and are consciously aware of. As I mentioned earlier, uh, there was a big outflux of students five or six years ago. And so we've tried to take the steps to uh, minimize that. We have seen uh, that trend to start to reverse and that um, open enrollment uh, in versus out starting to shrink a little bit. It's kind of like in, in business, right? You, you don't just wake up one morning and say, I'm gonna sell more widgets today. It takes time, you have to have a a plan, and um, I think that, that that's starting to reverse. But uh, the, the factual numbers are that right now it's about 160 students that we lose compared to what we gain as a net. Does Floyd, that the, Floyd, does that answer the question or get at the heart of the question that you're asking? That does. Thank you very much. Okay. Yes. Yes. I'm glad. I'm glad that. So the next question is: Is there an idea on what the sale price could be for Lincoln in the current market, provided a larger incentive to sell? Uh, so we don't know that number for sure. Um, we, we did have a market study done on Rockbridge. Uh, and I know that we're, this is Rockbridge and not Lincoln that I'm talking about. But uh, when, we, when we did that market study um, and, and subsequently sold Rockbridge, we got $125,000 for that piece of property. When we were going through that process, we had about five bidders who were uh, showing some interest uh, of that property for various reasons, whether it was to be to convert to apartments, uh, to use as a church, um, uh, to use as other office space or other buildings. Really um, what made it uh, unfavorable uh, to others except for one group was uh, how the facility was tied to um, Rock, Rockbridge Utilities and or a well and so on. Uh, and that made it kind of a little bit undesirable. I think that uh, Lincoln is much more desirable. You're, you're right in town, you're hooked to city water, uh, you have access to uh, high-speed internet, you know, all those things, you don't have a well you need to be worried about. And I think that those bidders um, will be reinterested in, uh, should we sell that? I know that because they were asking questions around that facility when they saw that we were um, in a in a other referendum in November, and they were wondering if uh, if we were going to be selling it right away. So I think there will be high interest in it, and hopefully we'll get uh, as good a dollar as we can from it. That's the best I can answer that question. Just to be respectful to the people here as well, do any of you guys have questions before we go back to the chat? I questions? have one from Barry, some boy, two parter, one name. Uh, enrolled in each of these four schools at present time. In other words, what's the breakdown of attendance in the third, fifth, K2, sixth, eighth? Okay, we, we generally have about 100 students per graduating class. Right around there is our average. But I would say but, that their, their elementary students were more at about the 80 to 85. So our upper, our upper classes, the high school classes, and our 
current sixth grade class. They're at 100 or, but our five fifth graders on down were between 80 and 85 students in the classroom. I'm talking about the four schools or whatever you want. How many are in attendance at the third fifth grade? Oh, so third through fifth grade would be about 85 times three is 50, about 240, 250. Yeah, how about kindergarten through second? Well, it'd be pre kindergarten through second. And again, that's where we're, you know, well, you just want kindergarten through second? Whatever. I mean, it would be, it would be around 250 for kindergarten, first sec and second. Uh, and then six, eight, uh, six, eight, 250. Well, about 400 at the high school. But the down, uh, you didn't get the early childhood in 4K. Right. The, yeah. So with the early childhood in 4K, uh, we have about uh, 80 students, but in 4K, they go two full days a week. Okay. So the, the, the bodies. Complex right. Number, not. Right. So, so I would add about half of that. So about 40 to 45 students on a daily basis with the 4K. A parallel then, if I may. Yep. The breakdown for this referendum, 1970. What is the amount for each of these four different individual, in other words, for the intermediate, what's the projected cost of this building? Everything associated with that. That's the cost of upgrade thousand middle school, high school. Okay. Kevin? I can, I can respond to that a little bit. The, um, obviously, as you can imagine, developing the budget for all these projects um, is fairly complicated and it's structured in a way where what we did was we developed all the costs for the construction related to the code, maintenance, ADA, additions, remodels, um, elevator, all those kinds of things. And then we, because it's a budget, we've developed uh, the contingencies required for those. And then we've got a full summary of all the site related costs at each of the campuses. And then we've got a summary of all of the costs that are outside of what you would see uh, in a bid, for example, furniture, technology, uh, testing materials, hazardous material abatement. And the way this is all built to create the 19.7, it's difficult to just pull out one project and say, well, how much are you spending at that campus? We can do that, but it would take some time to basically dissect the overall total project budget and make sure that we've got the uh, contingencies applied to each individual project. So we don't currently have it structured that way. We've built, we've built this, this budget opinion based on all the components that, that we're looking at and combined them into one kind of super budget, if that makes sense. But with a, it would take a little bit of time to give you specific numbers at each campus. But clearly, the largest project is at the middle school campus because we're essentially building a new intermediate school there. Is that an answer? I thought. Yeah. The, the work that the work that's being done at Doudna is is very small compared to that. It's some minor remodeling. There is no addition, um, but there are other urgent and required components that need to be done to to meet code and ADA. Uh, and maintenance needs. The high school piece is is better than what's being done at Doudna because we are putting a new roof uh, on at the high school, and that's a that is a big ticket item. Sorry, I can't answer your question more specifically, um, but we could do that for folks if you want to see what this what's specifically being spent at each of the three campuses. Any other follow-ups? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, the reason I'm asking is I would like to understand why is it uh, square footage, et cetera, for the new intermediate school. How does that compare to say the Jefferson school? And is it not potentially 
we're looking at converting the Jefferson School to this new intermediate school. Yeah, uh, uh, actually, go against the new construction costs. Yeah. Some of the challenges there with Jefferson and Lincoln, for that matter, those schools were, were built so long ago when, when schools were so much different than they are now. I mean, we really didn't even have special ed classrooms when those schools were built. And classrooms were much, much smaller. We didn't have computers. We didn't have all the technology that's integrated into schools. So as we looked at Jefferson to just try to make it fit national standards with the current enrollment for the grade served, the site just isn't big enough. So what we are going to have to do is reduce it down to just two grades. And once you reduce a school down to two grades, it's really hard to be efficient uh, because of the staffing that's required and the operating cost that goes along with an older building. So it's going to be much more efficient for you operationally down the road, which you basically pay your ongoing taxes for to operate the building and, and, and the staffing that support the program at each of those buildings. Yeah, and Kevin, I'll add this part. We, we did look at that in detail um, with, with two four building options. One that would have the EC4K at Jefferson uh, and then one that would have just second and third grade at Jefferson. The other grades uh, within that mixture would be at Doudna. Uh, when we did that and we sat down with the model and tried to make sure that we had everything in it that we could uh, from, a, from a standpoint of, uh, we knew we couldn't capture everything from the 27 million, but what, what do we need to capture in order to do the programming that we want to do? Those building models came in at you know 20.5, plus uh, million. Yeah. At, yeah, there was one that was 22 and then there was 20.5. Uh, and this one was a 19.7 uh, and it's more efficient. And so that's why we really ended up focusing on this one. That makes sense to you? Okay. Well, I just want to make sure we answered the question for you. Uh, so the next uh, question Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, referring to the tax base question, does the general obligation bond require any unpaid taxes to fall upon those who are paying taxes to make up the delinquent amount, therefore increasing taxes for those taxpayers? Kevin, you want to sure. that how that works? Oh, yeah. So that's a really, again, good question. Um, so in Wisconsin, school district taxes. Um, are collected locally, they're, they're assessed by uh, the municipality. And then in August, the county assumes the responsibility for collecting any unpaid taxes, any delinquencies. So the school district is settled in full with, in August. If those delinquencies remain outstanding for a period of time, the county has the responsibility for, for doing whatever they do, whether they foreclose on the property or however they collect those unpaid delinquent taxes. If there is after the sale of the property, assuming there's just no other way to collect the property, after the property is sold, the taxes are settled. If there are unpaid balances, then it's split back around between the school district, the, the county, uh, and the local municipalities. So um, in Wisconsin, we're really fortunate that that uh, doesn't happen very often. It's very infrequent, and uh, when it does, you know, the school district doesn't really see that hit until if everything is really settled and you know the, the final adjudication has taken place. Yeah. Okay. Do we have the current space within Doudna, Richland Middle School, and High School? If we shift grades around, like moving seventh, eighth grade to the high school, and perhaps four or five to the middle school. I realize these are unfavorable options, but would like to know if the space is there. Uh, so uh, one could argue classroom space is available. Uh, however, uh, that being said, uh, as we really dove into that, uh, the, the, the places that would get harder or more difficult to manage are in the related arts areas, art, music, FIAD, 
um, other elective courses, especially at the high school and the middle school, um, and, and special ed opportunities, special education classrooms. Uh, so there is space. Uh, um, some of the space that was here at the high school has been taken up by other programming uh, needs as we move forward when that became um, kind of the, the model that most of our, um, our respondents felt is unfavorable. Um, but that being said, I will reserve that to, you know, uh, anything can be done. And this community has seen our basements of our churches be used as classrooms for schools. Uh, so um, I don't want to say, no, it can't be done. Uh, we've done other things uh, uh, such as that um, to make an educational program work. So I know November failed, but I don't know if any other items changed other than the addition moved to RMS instead of Doudna. What is the price difference of making the addition at RMS instead of doing the addition to Doudna to house EC through five there? So Kevin, do you wanna tackle that? Yeah, I, I think there's a misunderstanding there because there was an addition planned at the middle school and at Doudna. The, the difference is that the middle school addition that was planned in November was only to support two grades. So it was just for fourth and fifth. So as we looked at this and tried to figure out a way to reduce this tax investment, the district came up with the idea of adding grades there so that we could try to house everything else in Doudna. So, it, so it's a little different situation than what your question asks. Um, you said, if the other items changed, but I don't know if any other items changed other than the addition moved to Doudna. Right, so, so I guess- uh, we're, doing a lot less, we're doing a lot less work at Doudna. Right, so, so let me point out that stuff a little bit, Kevin. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, the, the person who asked the question said, thanks for the clarification. So I wanna, I wanna make sure you, you know that because I don't know that you saw that in the chat. Okay. But um, uh, I will add that, uh, Besides not having the addition for the EC4K, which is what we did at Doudna in November or, or had on there, uh, we took that off uh, the plate altogether. There will be no addition at Doudna other than if we do have some uh, money saving in our bid process, we may put a small uh, storage uh, area addition on or something like that, which is why the question you see um, and or maybe an addition at Doudna. You know, um, we had that in there just in case, but it's not in the current plan. Uh, it's only in the current plan if we do have some realized savings through bidding process and so on. That's the next thing that the teachers would like is, is storage and, and possible independent restrooms in their current rooms that they would have at Doudna. That addition that was proposed at Doudna in the November election had those storage built in as well as independent toilets and were much larger uh, EC4K rooms than what they would be getting going into current out in the rooms. Uh, and and uh, that's one of the big things that changed. Another big thing that changed is we took the air conditioning out of Doudna that was in the last referendum. Uh, that was a large uh, ticket item around $800,000 or so that uh, we removed out of the total cost. We went down two classrooms uh, as well uh, it, it, to to uh, try to make some cost savings. So um, that being said, we, we still um, you know, have enough classrooms for the space of students that we would, would have. So hopefully that uh, clarified it. Jared, there's another challenge. At, I mean, both Dowden and the middle school are large sites, but what we noticed as the site got larger at Doudna, we really started to encroach on the floodplain Right. That's there to the south. And, and we didn't want to do that, obviously. We didn't want to grow the site too much and encroach on that. And even if it's just parking lot, it's really not ideal to put that in the floodplain. 
Next Any question. other questions from anybody present or online? I have some questions about the, uh, the $250,000 in the operating expenses. What what will be the net cost of both sources? Because well, we're going to have costs with the new addition. So we're not saving $250,000 because we'll have heating and utility costs for that. Do we know about how much per square foot that's going to cost or what, what, what does that look like? Yeah, go ahead, Kevin. I was going to say we know that it'll be more efficient, but do you have a number that you would use for? Yes, it was, it was about $51,000. Uh, for that addition of additional operating costs. And that assumes that we are meeting code minimum for energy efficiency. If we do more than code minimum for energy efficiency, we can reduce that operating costs, annual operating cost number. Where do we have to transport students? And will that be a bigger cost because some kids are walking to school in, in town, I'm assuming? I'll let Steve answer that one. Yeah, we do anticipate um, more students riding the bus, um, but the overall uh, net difference would be a cost savings in the reduction in transportation hours, time on a bus, maybe even the number of routes overall, because um, we're able to get them to three locations instead of having to spread out over five locations. So more students likely riding the bus, but less cost overall. And less time on the bus, most likely. I had a question about that 350 again. If we're losing students, you do the math, but if I, we give you the generous 14, um, 1,400, and we have 160 overall, isn't that approaching 12% somewhere in there? Our kids, 11, 12% somewhere in there? As yes, that, that's correct. So to me, it's not the buildings, but it's what is happening in the buildings. So as a taxpayer, you, we want you to provide the best educational opportunities. And as a taxpayer, I want that money to be directed toward the kids. Um, for example, I'm gonna be honest, I, I walk into the gym one day after school, look at a practice that was going on. There's a special ed student sitting on the bench while two unvetted volunteers were taking up the practice time. So my tax dollars were paying for those two unvetted volunteers to not have and having a special ed student sitting on the bench, not because they were being bad or being disciplined, um, not because it was a medical. So if we're not being inclusive, how are we going to get these people back? They're not leaving, I don't think, because of the building situation. They're leaving because what's happening in this building. And I know you know, there, there are kids that leave this district that will never, ever come back to the union, never come back to support this district or this town. What, so we're spending all this money. How can I be assured that my tax dollars are not going to be spent on some buddy coming in that isn't uh, receiving services like unvetted volunteers versus a child that should be, my tax dollars should be directed for it. How can we be yeah. sure inclusion is more than physical proximity? Inclusion means giving everybody that opportunity. So, Cindy, thank you for asking the question. I, I, I'll share that, this with you. One, I can't necessarily speak to some particular day that you witness something or not. That, that's we're here to talk about in general generalities. Uh, and you know, you, you run the grandparents program for Southwestern uh, Wisconsin. That's a great program. You're in a lot of schools. Yes, you vet those people. We use people like that. We vet our people too. Uh, and so I, I want to make sure that that doesn't go unchecked. We have a background check for every volunteer that we have and we vet them and we also train them to make sure that we're doing services. But let me answer the general app, the, the general question. Why are we putting money into facilities instead of programs? Okay. Let me answer that by saying uh, we went through a long process where we involved many members of the community to talk about where do we want to be for the next 10, 15, maybe even 20 years. Uh, same process that this community went through when they built this beautiful facility here. Um, because 
in building this beautiful facility, they knew that they were going to be offering a better place to offer better opportunities for the high school students that would come through here over the next 25, 50 and, and years into the future. That's what this community group had said. You know, they realized that we need two areas that we have to work on. Not only our programming and our staff and, and those kind of things, and that came in that operating referendum, but it was also paired with how can we maximize our facilities, best utilize our facilities, and best design our facilities to carry us out into the future. They told us, stop putting band-aids on old buildings that are not useful to us educationally. Invest in a structure that will take us out into the future. I'm here just communicating those wishes from those groups of people that who were in that strategic planning process, took a look at our SMART goals, took a look at our facility needs assessment that I talked about earlier, and all the many meetings that brought us to the point that took us to the November referendum and now the April referendum, because I, I don't think that the November referendum, we were able to communicate that as clearly as possible. I'm here tonight to try to communicate that as clearly as possible. This was born out of a large community group of people, lots of people, whether it was you at home answering a survey or attending a, a task force meeting or being on our ad hoc committee. Uh, you yourself, Cindy, have been to many of those meetings. You gave a lot of great input. And so the answer is, that is paired with that programming dollars. But we want to continue to look at a, a building for the future, not continue to put Band-Aids on old buildings that aren't instructionally the kind of programming or the needs that we have for students today. Those buildings were great buildings and wonderful buildings built when they were for the education that needed to be done for students then. Our world is very different now. Uh, we have different needs for our students and we have a different future that we're planning for than what was planned for those buildings that exist today. So that's the answer to that. I, I hope that you know answers your question. There was a cost about what's the operating cost of Jefferson specifically if it's empty. And I, I'm looking at a different screen. If you see my face, I'm looking at a screen that's got the breakdown of the, of the costs here. The custodial costs annually are about forty-five to fifty thousand dollars, and then there's telephone costs, and there are kind of annual maintenance costs, which you wouldn't need to spend anywhere near that. Um, that's kind of the average. So you would probably you'd still have to pay for an insurance, which is about four thousand dollars a year for that building. And you'd have to pay for, oh, some of the utilities, obviously, because you'd have to temper the heat in the building. But 90% of your operating costs would go away if the building was sitting empty. Okay, any other questions that came up in the chat? Doesn't look like it. Any other questions from our uh, present audience? Did we do some roof repair on the middle schools? We did some roof repair. Uh, we did not do all of the roof repair in the last referendum. You're correct. Any other questions? <laughs> okay. ADA. So we're replacing the bleachers at the intermediate or middle school. Middle school. Are, are our bleachers here ADA compliance? Yes, we, we, we have the bleachers and they have that section there. Okay. I should also point out that we do, uh, I didn't mention it on the site plan, but there is an elevator that goes to the lower level of the, of the middle school to allow students with disabilities to be able to get down there and get students. Yeah, and, and you know, there's a lot of people in the community who don't even know that we have a lower level on the middle school, but we do. Uh, that has the changing facilities and showers as well as um, a wrestling room and, and kind of a smaller workout area. Um, 
downstairs, uh, you know, if, if you're a, a student who has a trouble navigating stairs, um, you basically stay upstairs and you go over to the office area, change, or you change in a adjoining restroom that's in the hallway there. Uh, and then and then you have to come in. You don't get to be down with the rest of the other students and everything else. And so, um, in the new addition uh, of the uh, tech technology classroom, uh, two things happen. One, the elevator gets repaired and the external staircase that comes up outside uh, becomes an internal staircase uh, for uh, if we need to go uh, up and down uh, there, uh, at least it's uh, inside, more controlled, less maintenance. Jessica, you are welcome and don't worry about it. Uh, all your questions were great. And if you're thinking it, others are as well. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. We appreciate any questions uh, because uh, we just want to get the information out there. So any other questions from anybody else? Well, hopefully you know and you're informed on the facts. And if somebody asks you, a neighbor or a relative, somebody else uh, in the area, you can say, hey, I attended that meeting and here's what was, what was said. Uh, here's the information. So uh, we're, we're asking you to share the information that you know if you can. Frequently asked questions on the website. Yep. Oh, and not only do we have a frequently asked questions document uh, here for uh, those people who are in attendance, but uh, there is a frequently asked questions document that's on our webpage. So um, you can go on our webpage and uh, some of the questions that you might not have asked uh, are answered here. All right. Oh, wait, one more question. So I'm in that generation where we're going to retire as soon and that is, you know, we got that big boom of silver here, people. When, what about if we don't become taxpayers again? Are we replacing our young folk? Um, you know, as we move out of the, the area and that, and we've got this for 20 years, what is our population distribution as far as taxpayers look like? Significant amount of us are retirement age or competitive. Yeah. So, do you want to hit that uh, with the uh, population study that was done? Are you talking the student population study, or are you talking about the, the, the within the city and the district? The taxpayers that are paying us. What if we lose? You, you kind of touched on that, but yeah, I think as a general rule, I mean, I can't speak for what's going to happen or what isn't going to happen in the future, but as a general rule. Um, you know, the housing market is, is uh, there's a lot more demand than there is supply right now. So if, if people move out of the area for whatever reason, they're retiring, downsizing, whatever, those houses are getting scooped up quickly. Um, you know, as, as long as somebody owns it, there's going to be a property tax assessed to that bill, to that property. And then as it gets sold, it gets transferred to the next person. So uh, and except for the rare cases like Mr. Mullen spoke about where there's delinquent taxes, if there's a property that incurs taxes, you know, generally speaking, that's pretty stable. Would you add anything to that, Kevin? No, um, I think that's really well said. I, I guess, you know, it's a common problem, but, um, you know, what attracts young families to a community? You know, schools. And so, you know, I think right-sizing the school and doing the things proactively that you feel you need to do to put yourself in the best opportunity to attract families when that happens is the right thing to do. Any other questions that might have come up? Any thoughts? Uh, we be able to email a message out to all parents with this information. I haven't seen any communication come through uh, via email. That's a great idea. Yeah, that, that is a great idea, uh, Jessica, uh, especially if, uh, and I know you have my email, Jessica, if you can uh, specifically tell me what you think would be um, the best parts of what you heard today that we could focus on. Um, you, you know a number of people in the community uh, and you're very active in our PTO. Uh, if you can uh, tell us you know, what, what you know and, and ask those questions and guide us, I would, I would love to put together an email for that. So I mean, in general, on the referendum, not specifically tonight. Okay, yeah, uh, we can actually, um, you know, that flyer that is uh, on our webpage as well as uh, it went to every home uh, in our area through the Postal Service, but 
we can maybe uh, double down on that and send that direct uh, to uh, email parents and, and so on on our list. She's got ideas, maybe we can piggyback that. Okay. And uh, the other just asked if the video was available to watch later. I did record it. Uh, as long as everything works out properly, we will post that on our website as well. Okay. And Jared, last October, I think the district provided enrollment projections and enrollment history uh, on the website, on the district website, so people could see that too. I think there's value in sharing that. We've got a lot of questions about it tonight. Okay. Sounds like a good idea. Thank you, Kevin. Another question? Oh, yeah. So, how many kids do we have remaining virtual? And if they decide they like that format, we only do high school virtual. Do we know folks, folks that are um, below high school are going to maybe go to a different, um, you know, like Wisconsin Virtual Academy or something and we can still students? Yeah, so right now uh, we do have a virtual charter. It's for both middle school as well as high school students. Oh, okay. uh, yep, and, and through our through the pandemic, we actually expanded virtual opportunities to the elementary, as well as having alternative um, support uh, type coursework through Acellus, um, uh, which is pretty well received as well. Um, that being said, we, we have had a number of students uh, as the you know, community spread has gone down, coming back face to face. Um, and um, you know, we're going to have to really over the uh, spring and summer months, uh, be in contact with our, our families again, just like we were this last summer in preparation for this year. We know next year is going to look probably very different than it this year, but we also don't know if it's going to be a hundred percent back to what was pre COVID normal. And we also know that we've learned a lot during this last year and a half. Uh, as, as we've been um, building and changing, especially with our virtual programming. Uh, so there are parts of that uh, that we're going to keep. Uh, we keep getting better. Matter of fact, one of the things that you heard the middle school say is, you know, right within our, the, the middle school part of our facility, we found out ways to become more efficient through this whole community discussion uh, and, and some of the strategic planning that's been taking place. We'll do the same with the things from the pandemic that we thought did good uh, and offered uh, better programming for students. We're going to keep those and we're going to we're going to capitalize on those. I would also add just just to clarify the the FTE the full time equivalency students that Mr. Burke alluded to earlier that we get funded on. That's different than actual bodies in in our classrooms. Okay? Right. And so if we have a resident student that. It was going to the Richland Center High School and now chose the Richland Online Academy. We still get funded for that there. Now they're not physically in our building, but they are still a resident of our school district. So I think you asked about, do we, do we lose funding for that if they go virtual? And the answer would be no. If they choose Richland Center, but if they choose another virtual avenue, then they would lose. Correct. That's right. We would. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you again for attending. Uh, and please, if you have any other questions, just give us a call at the uh, district office. Uh, and uh, we appreciate your attendance tonight. Anything else you have to say, uh, Mr. Moore? Uh, no, thank you very much. Uh, the frequently asked questions document gets updated as we get more questions that uh, are repetitive, we add those to those documents. So keep checking back for it. Thank you.